Welcome and thank you for attending our Facilities Fundamentals Workshop. This is the first in a series of workshops utilizing the skills and experience of our staff to benefit the campus community while telling our story as a department. Today's workshop, Helpful Tips for the DIY Gardener, is facilitated by Jason Cottrell. Jason has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Ornamental Horticulture and Landscape Design from the University of Tennessee. Prior to working at UT, Jason worked as a horticulturalist at Blackberry Farm Resort for seven years. In 2005, he joined the UT Facilities Services staff as a horticulturalist and is now an assistant director overseeing landscape services. The landscape unit is comprised of 40 full-time staff and 10 seasonal staff members. They maintain 600 acres of main campus and 200 acres on the Cherokee farm. He has over 20 years of experience in the commercial landscape maintenance industry. Ladies, please welcome Jason Cottrell. So I'm assuming that most of your putting together a honey-do list, I guess. <laughs> so now in, in, in thinking about who might be here today, of course I knew there was a large number of females that, 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 um, that had RSVP. I thought there might be at least one male in the group, and I was going to pick on him. But anyway, <laughs> so with that being said, um, I don't know you know, what your experiences are, how, how, if you have any avid gardeners in here, what have you, but um, I guess my intent for this presentation is to hopefully touch on some things you don't know and hopefully give you some some tips that will help help you at home and improve aesthetics, but also help to save some time, too, because some of the things that you'll note in here that I'll, I'll, I'll go over um, are time-saving tips or, you know, use of herbicides with them and so on. So we'll move on into it. Um, once again, DIY Gardener, tips for the DIY Gardener. In today's presentation, we're going to talk about lawn preparation um, and also just basic care of, of the lawn. Talk about bed maintenance and uh, pruning and some, some basic planting practices. We're not going to dive in too deep on the pruning and planting, but just the general basics. I could talk all day on proper planting and pruning. We'll start with the lawn. It seems like most of the questions I get from folks, whether it's just people at UT or co-workers or uh, people at church or what have you, they're always asking about the lawn. And what, uh, what can they do to have a better looking lawn? So we'll dive into that first. Uh, so what affects turf quality? You've got uh, weeds, and obviously the competition that weeds pr uh, provide against against the turf grass. They, they compete for nutrients and water, sunlight, um, irrigation. So, so how much and when is the proper time to irrigate? Mowing techniques, light exposure. You know what's important to a turf grass as far as as far as its need for need for sunlight. And then also soil, and soil is kind of a hidden hidden element that we'll dive into a little bit. Use of herbicides with weeds. Okay, obviously in a lawn, you can go out there and pull weeds all day long. You're not going to win that battle. Um, I'm a tree hugger. I like to go as green as possible. Don't like to use a whole lot of herbicides, but I will tell you, you have to, you have to use herbicides if you're going to if you want to have a pristine lawn. So. With weed control in the lawn and in the landscape, but we'll talk about the lawn first, you want to be as proactive as possible. And what that means is, is most people don't think about the weed until they see the weed. You need to be as proactive as possible by using pre-emergent. You have pre-emergent herbicides and post-emergent. The definition of those, pre-emergent is obviously pre-game. It's the pre-game show. It's before the weed emerges. And obviously post-emergent would be actually a, a, a liquid that you would mix a concentrate uh, and spray after you see the weed. So we're going to focus primarily on pre-emergent. Um, let's talk about a weed seed. So let's say this right here is a weed seed. 
It's sitting here in the soil. It's waiting for optimum water, optimum sunlight, optimum soil temperature. Once the soil temperatures start rising in the spring, that seed, the first thing it's going to do is throw a tap root into the soil. Once that tap root has established, then at that point in time, it's going to start the above ground growth that everybody sees. What's important about that tap root is that if it hits a, a, if it hits a pre emergent herbicide, it will kill that root. Therefore, that weed never has a chance. So, this is just an example. This is one product. It's called Dimension. It's probably one of the better, on, best products on the market for lawn pre emergent uh, application for weed control. It is a granular product. You're not going to be able to go out and buy this at Home Depot, Lowe's, Garden Centers. You're going to have to go to John Deere Landscapes or uh, Keeling or some of the commercial suppliers. Homeowners can buy from these folks. You can only buy uh, unregulated, non-restricted chemicals from them. So this is a, a non-restricted, a non-EPA restricted herbicide. You can walk in off the street and buy it. Not a problem. The key time to put this down. And I'll just, this just helps most people. But most people remember this more than anything. It's before the forsythias bloom. Forsythias have been shown to, to coincide with uh, germination of weeds and a lot of our, our weed problems that we have. So for all case and purposes, Capri Emergent needs to go down in February, okay? By applying it in February, you have a few rains that hopefully can take place it will create a layer in the soil and then you've, you've got about an 80 to 90 percent protection then against the weed popper. You're still going to have some weeds and that's when you go back in with your broadleaf herbicides and so forth. So. Mm, yeah. Do you do that yearly? You do that yearly. Yeah. Okay. And then if you're concerned about crabgrass yeah. and summer weedy grasses that pop in, then you want to go back in about two months later. You want to read the label. It'll give you some instruction. But typically, most products are about two months later. You can go back in and do another application, and they'll, they'll give you control throughout the summer, or at least during the time frame in which those summer grasses are germinating. You don't want to wait too late in the summer to put these down, though, because then in the fall, you're going to do a renovation or you're going to do overseeding. And, and I've already explained how it works. Yeah. It'll affect your overseeding. So, all right. Um, so, first, post emergent, I'm not going to go dive into that too much, but. You know, there's plenty of products on the market for, for broadleaf weed control in the lawn. One thing I will tell you, one tip I will tell you, is most of these herbicides, or uh, post emergent herbicides, do not have a surfactant. A surfactant is like a oil that allows the, it breaks the bond of any waxy coat or any pubescence that's on the, on the leaf surface. You can certainly buy a surfactant. I never see surfactants for on, on, on the shelf at Home Depot, Lowe's, Garden Centers. You can only find them in co op and other places. But uh, you can also just use liquid dish soap. Just use Dawn or Joy or Kamala or whatever. So, so a few, you know, a few tablespoons for a, a tank. Uh, all right. So we'll dive into irrigation. So how much, how much is too much? What's too little? And what's just right? Um, and then also we're going to talk about a little about when is the right time to water. So let's talk about when first. Textbook time to water a lawn is going to be as close to daylight as possible. I mean, you can water five o'clock in the morning before daylight. That's fine. You can even water after that after the sun comes up. Don't wait till too late in the day because you're just wasting water. It evaporates too quickly. By watering at night before you go to bed or in the middle of the night, what's happening is you're introducing moisture that's going to sit around in that lawn all night long especially with our high humidity that we have in the summer months, that's going to invite all sorts of fungus and disease problems. So basically, as close to sunrise as possible. Um, how much? So once again, textbook, one and a half to one and a half inches of rainfall per, per week is what a tall fescue lawn requires. It basically, grass is waterlogged. Um, shrubs, trees don't require a whole lot of water once they're established, but turf is a continual water hog its entire lifespan. So 
Um, but you don't want to water that one and a half inch of rainfall all at one time. You don't want to just put it all down in one day and say, okay, I'm good for the week. You need to break that up into frequent waterings so that you're, you're getting that soil, that root zone satisfied, and then you wait a day or so, and so every other day is, is, is about right for the summer months. Um, obviously not as much in the spring and the fall, but, but uh, summer you definitely need to keep water on the lawn if you've got a, a nice healthy lawn every other day in the heat of the summer, especially for a drought. And then drainage. Drainage is important. If you, if you have poor drainage, you obviously have water sitting in the lawn. You may have a heavy clay soil. You may have low areas. Obviously, you can fix the low areas by filling those in. That's not an issue, really. Um, we'll talk about what's under the, under the uh, surface here in a few minutes. but. Um, if you have a dull mower blade, you're going to have, if you, look, if you lay down and look in the lawn, kind of like, honey, I shrunk the kids, you, you're looking at, you're looking at uh, grass blades that have been ripped, ripped off, They've been, or the, the tips have been torn off, they haven't been cut. If you have a clean cut on a grass blade, then it, it kind of cauterizes itself and it seals up and, it, and you, you, know, you stop water loss um, and it heals pretty quickly. When you, when you rip the blade of grass, not only is it aesthetically uh, not very pretty, but um, you're creating more sites for water loss. That grass blade has a hard time of kind of sealing off those wounds and also opens up more and more site, you know, more, more um, surface area for disease and fungus to, to set in. Okay, so sharp mower blade is important. You usually want to sharpen your blade at least once a year. If you're one of those that hits rocks and sticks a lot, maybe more than, more than once. So a lawn that is <clears throat> cut with a, a dull mower blade will kind of look like it's been chewed. And, and, uh, and have, that, have that dull, but basically you'll lose that green, that green health. And, and you can have the healthiest lawn in the, in the subdivision and it's still going to look terrible if it's cut with a dull blade. Cutting height. Cutting height is important on tall fescue. Ignore the one, two, and three inch. Tall fescue needs to be cut in that three and a half to four inch range. Okay? Where people make the mistake is when they think, well, I can just lower my mower deck down and it'll, I won't have to mow for two or three weeks. Well, you may not have to mow the rest of the summer to do that because you're probably just going to burn, burn your, you're going to scalp your, your lawn and, and that's it. Especially if you do that in the middle of summer. But what this slide is supposed to represent is the one-third rule. You want to make sure that you're mowing your lawn often enough in the spring, that means maybe more than once a week, to remove no more than about a third of the growth. Once you start moving into removing half of the growth or half of the height, then uh, you stand a chance of potentially scalping the lawn and getting down into that sheet, that uh, um, growing sheath that we mentioned earlier and potentially damaging the lawn over the long term. It takes, it takes turf grass a whole lot longer to pull back from a, scalp, from a scalp situation. When you've gone into that growth sheath with the blade, it has to pull from its reserves, has to pull from its reserved energy to, to restore that, uh, that blade, or that, restore that system. So you want to make sure that you're cutting in the, in the blade zone. <coughs> And then grass clippings, we'll get into light here in just a minute, but obviously grass clippings, if you'll notice here, that those grass clippings are so thick, they're, they're not only blocking sunlight from hitting the, the lawn, but also probably in the heat of the summer, they're holding heat in, which will kill, kill, uh, kill out the lawn as well. And also it's perfect holding site for, for fungus and disease. Um, and also it just doesn't look good. So um, ideally if you, if you're not removing your clippings through a bagger, you want to use a mulching mulching blade. So you're so you're chopping those cuttings into those clippings into multiple pieces. And that's actually good because then you're kind of actually feeding the lawn as you go. It, you do have nitrogen and, and uh, phosphorus, potassium that's inside that clipping, and then it breaks down and feeds the lawn as well. So light. All I have to say about light is turf. 
any kind of turf enjoys life. I have noticed that tall fescue though will do probably better than anywhere on the north and east side of the, of the home, especially a two-story home. It, it likes that exposure to the sky and gets enough foot candles of light throughout the day, but it, it likes to be kind of in that shady area of the, of the, of the uh, residential home because the shade from the home is producing uh, a cooling effect throughout the whole day, so you're not losing soil uh, through the, I mean, I'm sorry, moisture through the soil and excess moisture loss through the, through the grass blades. Whereas grass on the uh, south and western exposure tends to, once again, tends to be a water hog. So thinking about kind of where you want to keep your lawn, uh, or if you've got a new home, you're trying to figure out where to have your lawn areas and how to position your house. It's something I want to think about. Um, if you like trees and grass, you're going to have a little bit of a problem. Although I, although I mentioned fescue and even Bermuda grass, they like sun. They, uh, trees create shade, but also they suck up all the nutrients and all the water, and, and you have a competition between the, the tree roots and the grass roots. So. All right, so I mentioned soil conditions a little bit ago, kind of a hidden problem. Most, <coughs> most homeowners have no idea what their pH levels are. Yeah. They have no idea what's going on under the surface. So I want to touch on this a little bit. Let's talk about soil a little bit. So soil, that slide may be kind of hard to read, but this is basically your soil triangle. Every soil has clay, silt, and sand, hopefully. Soils that have more clay than anything else, you're going to have problems. If you have more silt, you're going to have problems. You can't grow grass and sand. Well, maybe for me to grass. But anyway, you really want to have a good, a, good, uh, a good mixture of all three. If you have drainage issues, you may have a little more sand in the mix. Um, you may want to introduce more sand. If you're trying to, to grow a Bermuda lawn, you may introduce more sand top dress with sand over a period of years. But um, just want to kind of make sure everybody understood kind of what the general soil makeup is. Um, so you have, ideally you want kind of equal parts of clay, silt, and sand. Now, this is a image. This is an image of a kind of a perfect soil profile. You've got your organic zone at the top, and as you move further down, you get into the clay, and then eventually into you know, bedrock. But uh, the reason I throw this slide in there is to kind of explain what happens in home, any kind of construction. A contractor comes in, they just they just ruin the whole soil profile. They, they dig down for the footers, they pull all the clay up to the top, and they leave the homeowner with a problem. So in a best case scenario, you work with the contractor to pull all the topsoil off, stockpile it, and then when construction's finished, you reintroduce that to the site. But if you haven't done that, then you have to deal with the problem. So all that I'm explaining here is that you may have to do some soil restoration in order to get a good healthy soil for, for any kind of plant growth, but you know, we're kind of focusing here on, on turf right now. Um, you do want some clay. Clay is important because it is a holding site for moisture. You do want some sand because that allows for air and water exchange and movement. And you do want some, some silt as well as that holds a good holding site for your, your macro and micronutrients. So we talked about the soil tests and fertility. Fertility and the ability of, of any plant to pull what's in the soil nutrient-wise up through the root system, you have to have a good pH. So this slide was thrown in there to kind of help you understand what's in the soil. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all the way down to iron and uh, copper zinc. And then I mentioned the clay soils and compaction. So we're going to move to compaction just real quick. Um, you know, a, a car that's parked, a teenager's car that doesn't have room on the driveway or in the garage, you park it on the, in the grass for four years until they go off to college, or two, two years, I guess, they go to college. You know, that, that's compacting the soil. Uh, tailgaters on campus every other weekend in the fall, they're compacting the soil. You know, it's going to happen. So depending on how much compaction you have going on at home, you want to get yourself on 
a, uh, an aeration program. Uh, you don't necessarily have to aerate every year. I might recommend it for a new, a new lawn or new construction home, just because we know what construction does to a construction site. So the most important thing is, is you want to use, you want to rent an aerator that actually pulls the plug. It's called a core aerifier. It pulls plugs out of the soil and leaves an air pocket. You don't want to use something that just spikes the ground because you spike it, that, that's, that cavity is going to close back in. So obviously this is like a putting green or something, but that gives you an idea of what, you won't see this in tall fescue because it'll be hidden, but you have kind of an equal distribution of, of holes that have been produced in the soil. On a putting green, they remove the uh, plugs. Obviously you can't put it. They'll go back in and they'll, they'll backfill these. They'll, they'll top dress this with sand on a putting green. But at home, you just aerate, pull the plugs, leave the plugs. Those plugs will break up, and that uh, loose soil will move back down into, into these holes. So here is a shallow root system. This is a compacted soil. So in a compacted soil, you have an unhealthy, shallow root system. The root system can't really penetrate through those heavy soils. After aerification, you now have oxygen and water exchange, which is what a healthy root system needs. <coughs> um, as, as those plugs start to break down and filter back in, then uh, new roots start to develop in those, those plug sites, and then within just a few months, you should be improving, and over a period of a few years, you should be improving the root system of your lawn. What that does is two, two or three things. Number one, Deeper root system means you're probably having to water less because those roots are reaching out in further places. They're reaching down in the depth of the soil profile where they can capture more water. That also means in the summer months, you're going to have less die out over the course of summer and less work to have to do to restore in the, in the fall. So, real quick, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but when's the right time to renovate the lawn? Tall fescue, do not do anything now. <laughs> Don't go out and waste money on seed and, and so forth and so on. But what's going to happen is you'll, you'll get good results. It'll look great until we start warming up in the summer. The root system hasn't had a chance to develop to withstand the summer heat and summer drought, unless you're just going to plan on working out a lot of money for water bills. So best time to renovate for cool season turf, tall fescue specifically, will be in the fall. So what that means is you go in usually late July, August. If, if you just have a trashy lawn, you've got weeds, you need to, I would just recommend you start spraying around up and just spray everything out and start over. So you start that process early, because it's probably gonna take a couple, of, a couple of spray cycles to get all of that killed out. Make sure you're doing a soil test to see what you've got going on in the ground. And, uh, and then do a, do a lawn renovation, we'll talk about something here and then you can rent to, to help out with that. Um, warm season turf, Bermuda grass, zoysia, stuff like that, you uh, <clears throat> typically want to save those renovations for spring and summer, since that's the time of year when they love it. It's the, the drier the better for those turf grasses. So. I have down here at the bottom uh, a slit cedar. Okay, a slit cedar is a, looks like an aerator that you can rent, but it actually has a horizontal shaft with vertical blades about every two inches. And if you'll notice, it just slices a groove in the ground and you can set the depth. Typically, you want to just scarf out the ground about a quarter of an inch or maybe an eighth of an inch. What that allows you to do is that gives you a little groove so that when you are overseeding your lawn or trying to do a rest, uh, maybe a, a, a renovation of the lawn, you get good seed to soil contact. It's important that that seed has good contact with the soil. If you just throw the seed out, you're probably not gonna get all of that seed down to the soil surface. So what happens is, this creates like little corn rows where the seed drops in and you can act, it's actually best to run this maybe in, in, a, in a checkerboard pattern so that you, so that you, so that you crisscrossed, uh, you had crisscross patterns so, um, so by running this across a couple times and then um, overseeding as you water the lawn and as it rains, it, it'll wash that seed into those grooves and, 
and you can be very successful doing this. So if you'll notice in this particular one here, they may have had some crabgrass or maybe even some Bermuda that's, that's come into the summer into their Bermuda, into their fescue lawn. So they've just killed out um, a section of lawn with a, her with a herbicide, but they've gone ahead and, and run that slip seeder over the entire lawn. And then within a month or two, shouldn't even tell they've even been there. It should, it should look pristine and green with the right amount of water. So I know I'm skipping over this pretty quick, but that's the best way to renovate or restore an old lawn. Uh, 